So money plays a giant role in all of our lives, and yet for most of us, we kind of live on financial autopilot, where we don't really talk about money, we just make it, spend it, save it, give it, and it's kind of like one of those subjects we don't want to talk about, we don't want to think about, but here at church, we've been talking over the last number of weeks, what does the Bible say about money? What does the Bible teach about money. And what we find when we start exploring biblical truth about money is that the way God designed money and the way we use money are pretty different and radically different. And if we're going to lean into what God says about money, we're going to learn that God's like, hey, it's not your money. Sons and daughters, people have put your faith and trust in Jesus. I give you money for you to use, invest, in my kingdom and in my purposes and not in your own. And that's a radical shift that's a major change. But if we could start seeing money as something given to us by God to be used for his purposes and his kingdom, that maybe that's the secret of contentment that so many of us are longing for. That maybe if we could see that what he's given to us is enough, that we could be satisfied and we could invest in a kingdom that would never end We'd find contentment, peace, satisfaction in that. But honestly, that's a journey. To come to that conclusion, to get to the point where you see money differently than what everything else says around us, that's different. It's a change. And my great encouragement as we've walked through the Bible talking about money is that you would continue this journey, that you would continue to go to the Bible and ask God's Holy Spirit to guide you on your particular journey and your particular thoughts and spot in life about money and how you are to take steps in the conversation about kingdom money, for you to lean into that yourself. And what you'll find is God will meet you right where you are and guide you forward. We gave out a book earlier in the month called The Treasure Principle. Maybe this has been an encouragement to you. If you've not yet gotten a copy, you can visit guest services out in the atrium. We'd love to give you a copy, just a tool to help you on the journey of thinking about money, because here's the deal. If we could learn to trust God with our money, is there anything we can't trust Him with? I mean, if we can trust Him with our money, then pretty much anything we have, we could trust Him with those things, those feelings, those truths, everything. If we can trust Him with money, we can trust Him in every way question for you today. Here we go. When God looks at your giving practices, what does he see? Like if we believe God can see everything, if he's omniscient and all-knowing in every way and he can see every aspect of our lives, do you know what that means? It means he can see my bank account, he can see my credit card statement, he can see my budget, he can see my giving and my lack of giving. He can see all of that. When God sees my giving practices, what does he notice? What does he see? So there's a count in the Bible I want you to look at with me today in Mark chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, turn them on, open them up, Mark chapter 12. And what's so cool about this passage of Scripture is Jesus is looking at watching people give. And Jesus is watching, he's watching, and what does Jesus see? What is he going to notice? What does he value? Mark chapter 12, verse 41 through 44. Now, you must understand that Mark chapter 12 is just days away from Jesus dying on a cross. He's in Jerusalem at the temple, and he's having some of the last interactions he will with disciples before he dies. And he's teaching them about values within the kingdom of God. And he says in Mark chapter 12, verse 38, he gives a warning. He says, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, to have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. He has strong words for religious leaders that are living to draw attention to themselves. He's warning 
against religious hypocrisy where everything is about show, everything is about accolades from people, not realizing that God sees beyond all of that. He sees beyond our actions to our attitudes, that God can see everything. And, and so often we think we can fool God we can do things by display and do our activities and he doesn't see the real deal. We often think we can fool God like we fool ourselves, like we fool others. And if we could fool God, if we could fool him, then what we do on the outside would be all that matters. But because we can't fool God, he sees everything we do and why we do it. Which means in the context of money, he sees, yes, we spend, yes, we save, yes, we give. But what's most important to God is why we spend, why we give, why we save. That's at the core that God is looking at the attitude of our hearts. Jesus wants his disciples to know before he dies that God sees the heart behind actions. Check out what happens next in Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watch the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. This is super cool. Jesus likes watching people too, right? People watcher. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, verse 42. But a poor widow came and put in two very small amounts copper coins worth only a few cents. So he sits down. He's in Jerusalem. He's at the temple. He's actually at this incredible festival feast called Passover where everybody comes and it's a part of their religious obligation to come to this festival. And a part of their religious obligation is for them to give. And so throughout the temple courts, there's these containers, metal containers set out so that people can give their offerings. And you read the text, it says that many rich people threw, they threw in large amounts of money. Now, they don't have Apple Pay, they don't have text to give, they don't have paper money. We're talking about gold coins, silver coins, copper coins, metal. And they're walking in, and they're saying the wealthy people are throwing their money into these containers. Can you just hear that in your mind? They're walking up to the container, throwing money into these containers. All kinds of noise. Jesus notices this, but he also sees this poor woman. This poor probably notices, based on her dress, what she looks like. She comes and puts two small copper coins. It says she puts two small copper coins into the treasury. Could you hear that? In this crowd, there's a woman that takes two copper coins and didn't throw them. She puts them into the treasury. So the wealthy throwing money, making noise, this poor woman places two small coins, makes no noise. Jesus sees both, notices both but sees beyond the action to the motivation of the heart, verse 43. Calling his disciples to him, teachable moment here, guys. Jesus says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. He sees the motivation not the amount. He sees the attitude behind the giving, and he seems to draw out two types of people. There are people that give out of their wealth and people that give out of their poverty. And none of that is about how much someone gave. It's really an assessment of how much you have left over after you give. He says, There are people that have wealth, and they give, but even after they give, they still have wealth. And then there's the person that gives, and after they give, they don't have wealth. They're poor, and he's drawing a comparison. Yes, both gave, but how much did the individuals keep 
for themselves. One person gives out of their wealth and maintains their wealth. One person gives out of their poverty, and after they give, they have nothing left for themselves. So what does Jesus see, and what does he commend to us? Clearly, he sees both. He sees all the giving and the attitudes behind the giving seems to be drawing a conclusion that there's a wrong attitude, a wrong motivation, and a right motivation, and a right attitude. He seems to commend the person that gives, and after she gives, she has nothing left. And that's all we know. And in what you can see that Jesus doesn't do, like I would almost imagine Jesus at this point, he's about to die, he's about to say, I'm going to give you everything, I'm going to give you my very life. So disciples, I want you to see this. See these wealthy people? They're still wealthy even after they give. But see that poor lady? She gave everything she had, and you better be like her. And if you don't take a vow of poverty and give everything, 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 then you're not my disciple. But he doesn't say that, does he? So what's the point? Why does he do this? I think he wants us to think. He wants us to think about our money and not just be in financial autopilot. In the kingdom of God, the king sees the motivations of our hearts, and the motivation behind why we give matters to him. So what motivates you to give? What's the attitude behind your giving? Do you give to draw attention to yourself, to make noise? so everybody can see? Do you give because you feel guilty? And if you don't give, like you're like, I got so much for myself, so I should probably give something. Do you give to get a tax credit, a tax benefit? Is that why you give? Do you give because it sort of feels good? Oh, this is such a nice cause. I should probably give. Do you give out of a religious tradition? Do you give but hoard tons for yourself? Do you give because you see God as the owner of everything, and you're worshiping him, and here's my joyful giving to you? Do you give all that you have to live on? Do you give until it hurts? What motivates you? I think that's what Jesus is trying to teach. What motivates you to give? Because he sees that and notices that. What motivated this widow to sacrifice all she had, all she had, and give to the temple treasury? What kind of person does that? How did she do that? Why did she do that? Now, Jesus doesn't really say why she did it and what motivated her, but here's what we know about the Bible. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, 6, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. I think Jesus is looking at this poor widow, and he sees beyond her actions, behind her two coins, is faith. I believe. I trust you, God. And Jesus sees that, smells that, and goes, that's what makes me happy someone who gives in faith and believes that God is going to take care of them. Because when she gave all that she had, what did she have left? She had God. And to her, that meant she had everything. She had everything. So who among us gives like this? Show of hands. Everybody who gives everything you have, all that you have to live on, and holds nothing back, and all that you have is God. Anybody, anybody, I see no hands, right? Because like we look at this and we go, wait, I could never do this. This isn't like, is this reality? Can this really happen? Is someone out there do this? Like, how does this work? What would it take for me to get to a point that I so trusted God that I gave everything I had to live on and I trusted him to supply my every need? Because if that was possible, that I could trust him even a little bit more than I trust him now, I would want to do that. I want to trust him more with my money and every aspect of my life. So here's a couple practical questions to ask yourself when it comes to giving. Do you give out of duty or do you give out of joy and obedience? So here's the the duty part that this is a chore, this is a burden, this is something I gotta do, dang it, I gotta give, right? Because when it comes to the IRS time, I better have enough money in that charitable section, right? I got to do it. Or is it something that's a joy to you where you realize God has given me everything and in response to all that he's given me, I joyfully, worshipfully give and I'm generous. I dropped a verse in your app, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. 
really profound wisdom from Paul. He says to the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Remember, he sees your heart. Are you giving out of duty? Are you giving out of reluctancy? Are you giving out of compulsion? I gotta give. Or is there something that's joyful about it to you? I love, God says, someone who gives with a joyful heart that I also think God loves our obedience. I think for this woman, she knew that the Bible commanded her to give and to see her money is God's money. And so there was something like, hey, I don't really feel like giving. I'm not sure how I'm going to buy milk tomorrow, but I trust you, God. And so with joy and obedience, I'm going to give my money to you knowing you will take care of me. What would our lives look like if we were joyful and obedient in seeing our money, not reluctant and duty-bound? Second question, do you give randomly or deliberately. I mean, the things that happen that are most important to us, we prioritize, don't we? We have priorities in our lives. If the only time you think about giving is when you see a red kettle and a bell at Christmas, Salvation Army, is giving or generosity a priority to you? Or you get on social media and your second cousin is raising money on a GoFundMe account to bury your chihuahua. And you're like, oh, I feel so bad for her. I probably should give. And you give money. Or the bucket gets passed in church and you think about giving in that moment. And it's all based on feeling. It's all based on what I feel in that moment. If I feel good about giving, if I feel like I have enough money, then I feel good and I give. But that's not following Jesus. That's not prioritization. That's random. If God owns everything, and I'm his money manager, and he loves a cheerful giver, does giving and generosity show up in my budget? I mean, Netflix does. Netflix shows up in my budget, but does being generous and giving and seeing myself as God's, does that actually show up in my budget? I mean, I set aside money for this, and I set aside money for that, and I save for this, and I do that, but, but God has no place in my budget. Solomon says in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, I put this in your app as well, he says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Now, most of us aren't farmers. What does he mean by first fruits of your crops? He means the farmer at harvest time looks at what they harvest and says, hey, I get it, God. You have provided me with sun. You have provided me with rain. You have provided me with seed. This harvest comes from you. So before I spend, before I eat, before I save, before I store away, I am bringing you the first fruits of what I have gained from your harvest and that's how I honor you with my wealth. Translation to us, in modern times, that would mean, I believe God supplied my paycheck this week. He gave me this brain. He gave me this oxygen. He gave me this job. He gave me this ability to earn a wage. He gave me this money. And when it comes into my account, I realize it's not mine, it's all from him, so I budget and I prioritize and set aside money to give regularly and deliberately to him and be generous. Proverbs 3.9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Solomon's not saying you give so that you get more from God. He's saying if you can connect the dots that everything is from God and everything is to God, everything in between, I am here for you, God, and you're able to invest generously into other people, and you give and you sacrifice and love joyfully, if you're not reluctant or random about it, then God wants to give his sons and daughters more of all kinds of things. But if he can't trust you with what he gave you already, is he going to give you more of all kinds of things? 
And as you begin to joyfully and deliberately give, that's when you'll grow to be able to see a need and sacrifice. I don't believe, in my opinion, this widow woke up one day and was like, I'm going to give everything I have to live on to God. I, I don't think so. I think she has a story. I think she worked out her muscles and learned that God had given her everything and that she was in worship to give things to Him and to be generous to other people. And so she began not randomly giving, but giving generously, investing in the kingdom of God. She grew cheerful and saw God faithfully supply all her needs to overflowing. And as that occurred in her life, and she gained satisfaction from doing it, she was able, when a need came, when there was a situation and circumstance where she probably didn't feel like giving, to trust God and know He was faithful and sacrificed to advance His kingdom. This doesn't happen overnight. It's a muscle that you begin to use where you stop seeing everything as mine, mine, mine. And start seeing God as generous, faithful, kind. That you see all your resources as entrusted to you by Him. That you begin to use it to advance His kingdom because you know your kingdom is going to die when you die. But His kingdom will last forever. And so I partner with Him as His manager I want you to check out this story of a family from Faith Church on a journey thinking about giving. Watch this. Hi, my name is Derek Zerfus, and this is my wife, Carrie Zerfus, and we've been coming to Faith Church for about six years now. So when we started coming to Faith Church, um, we, we were not familiar at all with how to give. Uh, in fact, you know, early on, we, we broke down what we should give based off of what we felt like we were using. You know, maybe a couple of cups of coffee, some electricity, a chair, the child care. You know, we came up with a number that, that sort of we began to give that was based on what we felt like we were consuming. And, and um, we did that for a while until Pastor Joe's sermon a few years back on giving. And, and for me, that really opened my eyes in a, in a whole new way of, of what it meant to give, why we give of um, you know, how much we've been blessed by God and how much uh, that in turn you know, means we should be a conduit of those blessings to, to try to give back. And it wasn't our, all ours. And, um, and we needed to give back uh, to God who had, who had so graciously given so much to us in our lives. So Derek had a change of heart and the amount that we were gonna start giving to the church. And um, we had the talk about how much we were gonna give. And when I first saw the number, I was like, wow, I didn't budget for that. Um, <laughs> you know, I was a little out of my comfort zone. I've always been more of the saver and he's a little bit more of the spender. So I thought, oh, how are we gonna make this work? So over the next few years, um, we, we really began to change uh, the mindset on giving. And for a while there, it, it was always, well, if if good things happen at work, if I have a good year, if I have a good month, then I'll give more. But it was almost as if it was a, a contingency off of what we were getting. I started to, to realize that uh, we had to trust and have faith in God, and we had to take the step of giving first and, and be obedient with that. Uh, not because of what we're getting, but just because it I felt like it was the right thing to do, and I felt like that was what God was calling us to do. We, you know, we've been blessed in a lot of different ways, and um, to give back uh, was really important, regardless of um, what we were receiving, and, and that was sort of the next phase of, of our giving. So a few years later, uh, we received a letter in the mail from a good friend of ours um, asking us to support them to go on a mission trip, and uh, we, we're struggling with the amount to give. We wanted to joyfully give, but we weren't sure how much to give. Yeah, I, I, I had thrown out a number and said, what do you think of this? And, and Carrie actually said, well, I was thinking of a number that was double that, <laughs> which for our saver, that was, uh, that was an interesting uh, response. But uh, I said, wow, okay. You know, so we weren't really sure what to do and, and we prayed about it and, um, we then, you know, I found myself, you know, at home, ready to write a check and ready to give and, you know, still just not totally sure what we should, should give. Should we give the easy amount or the amount that Carrie had suggested, which was a little more uncomfortable? You know, and I prayed again and, and God just led me to give the bigger amount. 
you know, and, and that's kind of how it went down. So I, I wrote the check out, uh, I signed my name, and I set my pen down, and literally within seconds, my cell phone rang. I was working on a project for work, and the gentleman had called, and he essentially said, you know, we are moving forward on the project, but we're basically going to uh, change gears and move forward on one that was literally double the value. I was surprised, I was taken back. I, I did not expect that at all. And you know, I remember setting the phone down and, I, and as I set the phone down, I was looking at my checkbook and I was looking at the pen and it just kind of hit me. Like seconds before that, I was faced with the situation of, do we give this much or do we give double? And, and we chose the double, you know, and within a second afterwards, the phone rang and, and um, it was really, really remarkable. And, and I'm not here to say that if you give, you will immediately get double what you gave or anything like that. But uh, for that moment to occur so close together and so black and white was just a, a very eye-opening experience. And, and I think that was a big step for us in, in learning that we can trust God, that, that we can give, even if it is uncomfortable. Um, have faith and trust to give, to grow God's kingdom, and he'll take care of us. For us, and especially for me, it's about obedience and being obedient to God's word and what he's called and asked of us, and knowing that we can trust in him for all of our needs and he will provide for us. So it's a journey. It's not, this is what you have to do next. It's with God saying, God, I believe you're a part of my life. I've trusted you with my sin. I've asked you to forgive me and grant me eternal life. You've promised to give me eternal life. And now I trust you with everything between here and then. And I'm on a journey with you. Would you guide me? Would you lead me in what to do next? And he will gently lead and gently guide you. He is a gentleman. So it isn't, I want you to do this, right turn. May, no, it's a process that you start studying his word, you start asking for his guidance, and you start following what you know to be true. And as you take steps of obedience and you do that with joy, he's going to meet you and help you and continue to guide you. And if you're one of those individuals right now that you're going, again, this is why I hate coming to church, because all they do is talk about money. You know, one of my concerns about those types of people is that, you know, if you're really hypersensitive about this, maybe this problem is you and not the truth of the Bible. And maybe you just have to say, okay, I'm going to be open enough about this topic and bring it to the Lord and be vulnerable enough to bring everything I am, my sin, my shame, and my money into the light of Christ. And watch when you do that, how he comes to grant you purpose and peace and joy gently over time. Will you go on a journey with God and money? Because if you do, that's when you discover lasting peace, lasting joy, lasting purpose that will go on beyond the point of your death here on earth. Would you pray with me? God, thanks so much for your scriptures that address all areas of life and godliness. Money is a topic that's taught and spoken about in the Bible so many times. So forgive us for being on financial autopilot. Forgive us for following our feelings. Forgive us for not prioritizing an open and ominous conversation about money with you and with other people. Forgive us because money has so often become our treasure. And God, you know for me personally, money has been a treasure. You know for me that I've struggled with overspending. You know that I've had a struggle with not being generous and being reluctant in giving. Thank you that you've not smacked me around for that, but you've gently led me over time and instructed me and my wife in how to live and how to give 
and that we're still on a journey of growing and changing. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for taking us on a journey. Thank you for being our peace and our joy and our purpose. Please help us to trust you with everything. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.